<laughs> but my atomic clock was pretty close to on time. All right, let's see Call the 57th meeting of the National Association of Rocketry to order. There being no old business, the first item on the agenda is the election of Board of Trustees members. How many people plan to vote tonight? Okie dokie. So here's what we're going to do. If you have your NARC card, have it ready and go into the next room where they find people there. The judges carefully selected will take care of you. And we'll meet you back here in six minutes or 15. <laughs> Glasses was up here, maybe from a previous presentation. Anybody lose a pair of looks like reading glasses? Oh. Well, yeah. Oh. For a safety minute, we're going to move all the trip hazards. Trips ahead. Trips ahead. Sorry. So voting having closed, is there any new business? Awesome. Okay, well, I'd like to, uh, if that's all right with you then, segue right while we're waiting for the results, segue right to the um, presentation part of the town hall. Joyce has some announcements to make about scholarships and so on, but she's a little busy, so I'll start with this. So, how are we doing? First, let me introduce the officers. Uh, I'm the president, Ted Cochran. John Hockheimer is the vice president up here. Joyce Guzik is out. You, you saw her when you were doing the balloting. She's our secretary. Tom Ha doing the is doing the balloting, so we'll clap when he comes in. <laughs> Ryan Coleman doing, doing the balloting. Uh, Randy Gilbert had to go early. Vince Hughley. There he is. We got one. Hey, John Lindahl. Tom. Right here. We're in the new Spiffy NAR shirt. The screen's so bright, it's darkening him out. Here. And Mark Wise. There he is. Wearing the NARC's special logo shirt. We'd like to start, at least at my company, we'd like to start um, meeting sort of the safety minute. Thank you. Oh, you know what? Let's go with this, too. Um, Mark, you want to help hand these out? You guys can catch up. All right. So since we do these national events all around the country, not too many people, except for uh, Naram, when you see them over and over again, uh, get to see this slide. But this is the optimal setup for a range. You want to keep your spectators with the wind coming from one side or the other, so that when the rockets weathercock and crash upwind, they're away from the spectators. If they drift back downwind, they're also away from the spectators, and as a result, you can keep the dents in the cars and things like that to a minimum, please. Also, our default these days is to angle the rods away from the crowds about five degrees, which is about one inch per foot of launch guide. If you have a better idea or a good reason to do something different, feel free, but in general, uh, aiming the launch guide away from the crowd is a good idea. I have one question about that. Yes. What if, uh, say, the wind direction changes while you're launching? So? So, are your launch pads adjustable? It's more than where you're. Oh, you mean if you're if you're launch if you're in Minnesota and the cold front comes through and, and everything was fine? Where the, where the, uh, the spectators are at. Right. So. You have a choice, right? If you predicted the weather well, you can try to figure out what the best place will be. You can stop in the middle and rearrange the pad line or move some spectators. In Minnesota, we tend to have wind changes that are reverse. So it'll be northwest or south southeast, the cold front comes through and from the northwest. So wind comes from the left one day or one part of the day and from the right the other part of the day. That's like it is out here as well. But if, if the wind makes a 90 degree shift during the day, stay safe. Let's figure out what you have to do. Okay, so it's been a great year for us, for the uh, National Association of Rocketry. Our membership reached an all-time high. We, are, we were, uh, last, a couple months ago, we hit at the very end of the month 6,102 members. Uh, last month, I was a little bit busy at the end of the month and didn't quite catch it at the end. But this month, as of right now, we're at 6,088. So I expect to beat the 6,102 by the time we get to the end of the month. We have 166 sections. We have an extremely healthy financial position, a terrific magazine. Where's Tom? 
You haven't yet read the sport rocketry issue on the Museum of Flight uh, Narcon. Yeah, I would recommend it. That, has, that was a spectacular article. It's a well done issue, and as they all are. Um, we have a, high, a record high power certification rate. We just opened the new sport rocketry exhibit at the Museum of Flight and have a national collection of model and sport rocketry there. So Vernon Glead Estes have a collection at the Museum of Flight, the Steins have a collection. Uh, it's just an awesome collection and an awesome exhibit. If you're ever in Seattle, go take a look. How many people know our liability insurance is now five million dollars with fire insurance for the field of a million dollars on top of that? Ooh. Um, that's a very good and there's plenty to use it. Don't use it. This is not an excuse to be um, silly. It's a uh, really a paperwork exercise for those park boards and um, landowners that like extra insurance. I don't think, and, and heaven for fend, we ever will have an uh, event that's that expensive, but we have the insurance that people want it. How many people know that if you're 25 years and under, your membership dues are $25, not 62? Yeah. So all you cool. be divisioners, you have a few extra years before you have to pay the big bucks, $62 to join. <laughs> How many people know we have a new website? Oh, see? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we have a new section grants program. We're just rolling now. So anytime you need $250 worth of stuff, once a year every section can apply. You can apply for more than just uh, safety equipment. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So that, that is another service we're providing to members. We've consistently delivered on our partnerships with the AIA for TARC and NASA for the student launch program. John Lingdahl runs the student launch program. Trip Barber runs TARC. Both excellent programs. Um, the uh, NAA, National Aeronautic Association, gave us the Brewer Trophy, that's the uh, trip receiving the Brewer Trophy with the AIA people, um, which is a big deal. So that was a nice thing to do. And we've also increased our budget for education of grants and scholarships. It's now $35,000 for education of grants and scholarships, which is a significant item in our budget model. So here's our membership curve growing. Uh, I just updated these numbers this morning. We right now have 4,833 senior members, which is up 1,000 since 2010. 570 leaders, I'm really happy about that. That's uh, almost doubled. In fact, it has doubled since 2010, or almost doubled. Uh, junior members were up about a third, 635 juniors. And 35 life members are up about 11. About 30% of new members cite member referrals in every nine months or so and our volunteer gets to play with five dollar bills and envelopes and stuffing them in and <laughs> sending them out to you all some people got one person got a hundred dollar bill the last mailing um, lots of people get single five dollar bills it's a great program and also about 15 percent site vendors um, apogee in particular estes is getting up there as well what's the light gray line oh thank you um this light so the way the membership curves work at neon is your membership expires at the end of the month so people say, oh, I forgot, and they re-enroll, or you just get new people coming in. So this is the lowest that it gets in a month. So this is like the first of the month membership number, and this is the end of the month membership number. So you can take the average. We wanted to have a consistent 5,800, uh, and we're, we're at that. We haven't been below 5,800 for a couple months now, three months now. Thanks for your question. <laughs> Finances. So we, we have all these new members and we're spending some more money to support that new membership, but we still have um, a, a well-executed budget that's followed with uh, Hawk's eye by our treasurer, Tom Ha. Um, we have appropriate reserves. You can see that we had a, this is our funds balance. So this is sort of roughly kind of the amount of cash you have in your sock at the end of the month. Um, and as you can tell, we have this cycle where our, the beginning of our year is very expensive because we pay for insurance and we pay um, for our, the support that we do for the student launch program and then NASA reimburses us. So that, that's been getting bigger as our insurance has gotten more robust and as we do more for the student launch program we have a bigger dip but it'll climb back up again um, and the general balance is about right. Here's, um, this is about the level of budgeting that I can understand. So. <laughs> Previously, we had a treasurer, Stu, Stu was a great treasurer, but he did double entry accounting and he talked about, you know, 
correcting for this and adjusting for that and income before taxes and yada yada and pie chart. <laughs> we get most of our money from dues. We get a lot of money, uh, donations and grants, and this is particularly um, the company matching grant. So a lot of your companies, if you work for a big company, aerospace company in particular, if you donate X amount of money, they'll match it. That's where that comes from. Um, advertising <coughs> mostly in the sport rocketry. We do. Uh, we get reimbursed for TARC and we get reimbursed for SLI. And there's another line over there that balances that out. Uh, NARCs, we get some income from, and a bunch of other uh, cats and dogs. And then on the expenses side, magazine first, grants and awards. This includes scholarships um, and educational grants to teachers. Um, insurance, headquarters. Tark and SLI to balance that side. This is the money that we spend to support that. It gets reimbursed later. Um, miscellaneous stuff, postage, bank charges, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a, to try to be as transparent as possible. I can give you, Tom will be happy to give you broken down to the penny, but um, most people are really happy at this level. <laughs> So our magazine is the best it's ever been. We're now paying up to $350 for top quality how-to technical articles. Um, so you submit them, we publish them, we judge them. Um, articles that might not be quite at that level or, or maybe we've given all the $350 prizes out for that issue, there's still another year of membership is the um, second place. So we're always looking for great content. Um, Tom says he's probably got enough for right now, but that just means, as far as I'm concerned, that you have an extra year or so to write that perfect article on how to make an uh, exact scale model of a oh, Saturn one. I'm looking at you, Chris. <laughs> Our outreach programs are doing well. So we just finished the 13th year of TARC with 685 or so teams. Uh, we're about to start the 14th year of TARC. We're doing, as has been mentioned, the educational funding. We are an educational association, 501c3 educational association. So this is a big important part of our mission and we try to live up to that. 4-H partnership is strong and growing. We've had 4-H uh, teams actually win TARC in past years and uh, continue to enter TARC. We're gonna try to start working on them a little bit for what we got into their um, partnership for in the first place, which is land, because they're farmers. So we're thinking, <laughs> Hey, County Extension Service, you know any farmers that are raising, uh, have fields that are fallow this year, or raising hay and are about to cut it? We have a deal for you. Uh, the NASA student launch, I, I don't know how many people remember from last year, it got kind of bollocked up because there was a government shutdown and there were funding cuts and so forth. So it was in Salt Lake City. It was that actually on the salt flats, which is a great place to launch in some ways, but it was a lot of work and they wanted a separate site just in case the salt flats were flooded and anyway it's back to it was back to Huntsville this spring and it was big it was a, a lot of people next year they want us to support 60 up to 60 teams <laughs> launching in one day so soon it'll be like TARC and, and SLI but SLI is launching rockets to much larger and much higher altitudes so it's a lot of fun Seattle Museum of Flight I mentioned that it's in the magazine it's a wonderful um, idea of what's going on, but you really have to see that exhibit to appreciate it. There's a lot of cool stuff there. And we just started working with the Seal Air Patrol. We have a memor memorandum of understanding with them. Sorry, Ted? Yes. Did you say more about that last one? Seal Air Patrol. Vince. Yeah. You want to talk about Seal Air Patrol? Um, we uh, have an MOU signed with uh, the uh, directors that are at Maxwell Air Force Base that uh, or the educational counterparts. And we're trying to do the same thing we do with 4-H. We want Civil Air Patrol that has a wonderful education program to contact our people. Our people contact them, get together. We've got kids that want to fly. And if we all fly together, and can we find out where they're flying so we can fly with them too? Or they can come to our launch. Some of those groups have airports yeah. that they can close. And some of the TARC teams work that way. They close off a small airport and they say, no, you can't land here. we got we got a ride on us. So you technically <laughs> also know that we actually had some tech volunteers supporting the competition. That's right. Those guys in uniforms. Those yes. guys in uniforms that were at this uh, event, uh, timers especially, right. were civil air patrol people. So we have a diverse association. So um, in, in age, I, I did this curve up for you all this morning. What, what's really impressive 
look at this half of the curve. This is just, we all got two years older since the last time I did this, or maybe it was three years. So it's almost identical curve all the way up. We just got older. This part of the curve is kind of cool. It's not funny, man. <laughs> this part of the curve, we're getting a lot more members in that this is like 13 to 18 year uh, range, which is very cool. They'll be back. And a lot um, in the, the, the parents of kids, this is in the you know 20s and 30s. Um, so this is where our new membership is coming from. And so the, to the extent that this curve, it used to be that this curve, every year this was a little blip, and this was a curve kept on marching over to the right. And now I feel a little bit more comfortable that there'll be people to replace us as we all wander off. Uh, we have 300, about 300 contest flyers. We have about 3,000, about 60% of our eligible members, I mean, the kids can't be it, right? But 60% of the eligible members are high power certified, 157 juniors, almost 1,300 level ones, 1,200 level twos, almost 500 level threes. We have 325 teachers that are members, 160, or 160, I must have not located that number, 166 sections, about, 30, I looked that number up today too, about 3,400 section members. So there's lots of diversity out there. And it's a challenge to keep track of it all and, to, and uh, make sure that everybody is feeling equally served. Uh, so we, did an, we do a membership survey about every three years. We did the last one a year and a half ago, two years, something like that. About 725 members responded. There was really good consensus on the priorities, and back then it was, it was very clear. It was more support for sections, so we did the section grants program. Better support for uh, maintaining launch site access. So how many people know there's a section manual online on the website? Trip Barber did a big, huge write-up on the rewrite <coughs> re of that, and it has a huge section on this in particular. Um, John's been working with some groups to get, he was right there, <laughs> to get some launch sites. Um, can't say enough about it, if you've got a launch site, do everything in your power to keep that landowner and all his neighbors, his or her neighbors, very happy. Because it's much, much easier to keep a launch site than it is to get a new one. Um, and we, I've heard some really dumb stories, right? So it's, it's, and it's not always our fault. There might be a model plane field people using unmuffled gas motors when it was electric only at 8 o'clock when they were supposed to close at 6 in Minnesota. But we won't talk about that. Just make sure that your field your own landowner is as um, happy as can be and knows all the educational benefit they're providing to the community. Uh, new NAR member website, we did that, rolled that out last, just after uh, NAR last year. That's been continuously improved. Um, we have a new members only section right now. R&D reports are in it and we're gonna add more. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, more how-to article in sport rocketry, so we're paying for those now to try to attract more. Better insurance, we did that. Um, established the exhibit on sport rocketry in a major museum, we did that. Teacher support and scholarship programs, we're doing that. Next up is national events. That was the other thing people wanted improved. So, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Our priorities are to continue to make flight safety our big priority. If we hit one person, it, first of all, it takes a lot of our time. Uh, we have a case going on now that was kind of an unfortunate incident at uh, Fitz in Washington <coughs> State. Doesn't matter whether people are paying attention, doesn't matter whether it's your fault or not, it's still a big issue and the insurance companies get involved and lawyers get involved and it, it takes a lot of time and resources away. We don't want that to happen and it doesn't have to happen. Make sure that bad rockets land in good places. We want to support and celebrate all the kinds of sport rocketry there are. We want model rockets, level three high power, high performance to odd rocks, I love odd rocks, uh, sport, but safe ones. There's some, some that I launched on the sport range last, this weekend. Eh. Uh, <laughs> sport rocketry, international competition, we do it all. High power awards are new. Uh, we got new web con content for contest flying. Trip also did that rewrite of that section. Has anybody looked there? That's a big section of the web now. Um, and I'm not sure how much traffic it's getting. We can try to advertise it a little bit better. That was Chris Flanagan in line. Chris Flanagan, thank you. He had some Saturn One stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> we want to still continue to sustain and maybe even increase our organization size. It's, it's kind of at the point where if you keep doing good things, people will come to you. 
Um, so I'm looking at it now almost as much of a measure how well we're doing as opposed to a goal. Um, but we still, it's good to see and it helps us every time we get a uh, bump in membership, we get to do spend more money on section, active, you know, weather stations and horns and vests and we get to spend more money on scholarships and that sort of thing. Eventually we're going to have to um, figure out a uh, transition of headquarters to a full-time employee, right? Because we have about a third more members than we did a few years ago. And Marie, our headquarters person, is seeing that there's about a third more activity than there was. So um, we have to be ready to fund that when the time comes. More outreach and educational efforts. Um, all the opportunities to participate that you can ask for. So what we did recently as a board, this is both in Narcon earlier this year and uh, this year and a couple things, or just this week, and a couple of things a little bit earlier. We continue, we budgeted to do section grants on a continuous basis. So I won't tell you how much we budgeted, I will only tell you that you haven't come close to hitting it yet. So if you've got a section that has a $250 need for signage out on the road, rocket launch today to bring the traffic in, barriers on the field, did you see the nice pipe barriers that they had at the, the sport rings? That's kind of cool if you own the field, that'd be a neat thing to do. Um, better PA systems, any of that stuff. Uh, what we're going to try to do is get some bulk discounts. So we'll send out a survey to sections and we'll say, here's a list of stuff and here's about what it would cost us, cost you if we put a discount on it. You interested? <coughs> and if we have 30 people say, yeah, I like that best, that's kind of cool, NAR logo, that sort of thing, uh, we'll, we'll get it, make it available, and you can buy it through NAR at a discount. And you can still buy it without a discount if you want one for your very own, you know, ride your bicycle on it or something. <laughs> um, but we're going to try to do that as another way of making it easy to get this stuff. Again, we raised liability insurance to $5 million. That was this spring we did that. Um, we added $20,000 this year. This was, uh, again, at Narcon. We added $20,000 for scholarships. And we added another, um, it was actually 15, then we added another five this week. And uh, Joyce will talk about those when she gets back. Um, the rebump, the amount up to 2000 you know, $1,000 doesn't even buy your physics book anymore. So <laughs> we, we, had, we ask a lot. We ask for letters of recommendation, transcripts, and um, a, an essay from every applicant. So we said, you know, we'll give them $2,000 for doing that. So that's up to $2,000 per scholarship. We also had a lot of teachers that were not able to teach in the schools because it's not on the test that the students are supposed to get, right? So they do rocketry as an after-school activity now. Canon doesn't have that built in. Canon was for teacher, classroom teachers, classroom teacher grants. So we're funding an extracurricular activity grant for teachers, for those teachers that can't qualify for a Canon but still want to do rocketry. We're starting to support student teams in the small satellites for secondary schools. So you get some schools, maybe they're in Minnesota and it's freaking cold all winter, um, and they don't want to be building and testing airframes in January but they've got some kids who really want to play with electronics and do satellites. Um, so we have a program working with the small satellites for secondary schools. If teams took the top 25 TARC teams are interested in doing that, they can do that and we'll uh, subsidize their, actually it's no cost to them by the time they're done with it and they can send their satellite that will get launched on a K550, something like that, uh, to a mile. And it'll do its thing, measure the weather, measure wind, whatever, whatever they want to do. Um, the data can be telemetered back to them on the web, hopefully in real time when the satellite truck works. Otherwise, they get it after the fact, and they can analyze it and send in their report. So that's a cool program. The know the news. Supported the Museum of Flight, uh, support rocketry exhibit. Uh, bought another round of kit stuffers. So the Estes kit stuffers went away during the dark ages at Estes. Um, but now they're back, and you should be seeing most of those kits have now reached the um, pipeline, the retail pipeline. So you should be seeing kit stuffers with uh, the NAR logos, join the NAR in every kit, if I missed this. Um, and back issues of sport rocketry will go online. That's what we did this week. We've decided to put back <coughs> issues of sport rocketry online. They're in the members only side of the website. We'll start with the really old ones and, and gradually work our way as volunteer time permits so that the entire corpus of sport rocketry and also all the other predecessor journals, model rocketeer, so on, will be on the web, except for the last two years. 
So we'll keep the last two years to ourselves and sell those issues back, issues to Mark Stone. Um, there are occasional technical articles in the past where certain critical items have been left out through the editing process. Is there any way that uh, I'd, an addendum for issues could be placed on that along with the actual issues. So Ryan, I heard a volunteer mm -hmm. for yeah, identifying. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to do. It's we much, much easier to do that than go back and write them on the support rocket trees that are in the libraries around the country, right? Yes, we'll just, well, initially we imagined having a support rocket tree issue by issue, but you could have, you know, a support rocket tree January 1968 with an addendum saying also see this, you know, errata or addition for that, for this, you can do that. We have the technology. Then, yes. Will those issues also be indexed or searchable? Or is it just yes? Uh, uh, I'm not going to with <laughs> Okay, so, short story. If someone wants to, uh, the we answer could, could be, be they need to be OCR, uh, and then they can be searched. Right now, they're going to be up as, we're going to, right now, NARCH, when you buy 1968, um, support rocketry, you get one ginormous Adobe Acrobat file. We're going to at least chop that into six ginormous Adobe Acrobat files, but um, there's they're image files, so you can read them, but you can't search them. So we'd have to OCR them. And so it starts to get to be a lot of work. We'll see <coughs> if there's a demand. We'll see if we have volunteers. Yeah. Yes? Um, with stuff like that, if the process to do it can be standardized in yes. a way that works, then just let the community do it. Yes, it can be just like SETI, but we need yeah. volunteers to <laughs> set up the process, try, try it out, make sure it works, check the results. I mean, it's it's not a small undertaking, baby steps, right? We're, okay. We're going to have, TRIP has already got the index of all the technical articles that were ever done in Sport Rocket. That's up there, along with the articles, by the way. So this is the magazines themselves. So we've got a hunk of the content, but there's your plans and things like that that we people may want to get. So yes. Just a point for whoever eventually volunteers to do that. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, no, the current release of Acrobat does that automatically. It's one button click. You just say, make searchable. Yeah, that's it, exactly it what the not brochure says, yes. <laughs> no, I, no, but I use it a lot, and okay. it's like 99%. Yeah. Well, ninety-five percent. Okay, but so, so remember, nineteen sixty-eight when the plans for things like boost gliders were handwritten, and you know, fifty percent. Right. Now you'd, you'd have to go through obviously. And then when you search, you have to search for all the ways that the, the character writer could have misspelled them. Anyway, you're right. There's no. a lot of ways to make it easier, but we we've done a lot of stuff as an association in mm -hmm. fifty-seven and a half years, and so I'm sure that. Um, it'll be a big job, right? And if the association wants to spend resources on that, that's what we'll do. Jennifer? Ted, what you probably don't remember is that Lila had done an index up to 2007. So we I have know. that. And so, don't uh -oh. worry, Brian and I are on it. Right, well, I will, you know, I, I do crowdsourcing. For that's emails. the index, but that's not the, that's, as, that's as good as Lila has sorted things out. And if somebody says, I remember a boost glider, I think it was called Hyperion. Maybe it's there, maybe not. So that's why. It, but thank yeah. you for that. Remember. There was another question? I, I was going to mention why I was crying. Okay, yes. Thank you. Uh, also, so this is continuing $300 for support rocketry articles. We have these Rocket Science Achievement Awards. So I know that some people set the bar. We have this mile high. You can get an award for mile, or be on the website, mile high, two mile high. Somebody put it up at 22 miles. I know, but it's still fun to see all the one miles and two miles and three miles. Um, that's, and also we have them for supersonic flights, uh, for instrumentation flights. So that's kind of cool. Check out that on the website when you get a chance. Still doing the $5 recruit. We'll do that forever until, or until we get arrested for drug money laundering or something. <laughs> um, I have very interesting conversations with the credit union sometimes. <laughs> Um, expired motor testing program. You get an old motor, you can fly your old motors. We just ask for two things. We ask for advance notice so we know it's been done safely. We give you some extra rules. And we want the data so we know whether in the future we should be decertifying motors when they stop being manufactured. We might even get enough data to withdraw the decertification of old motors, but I kind of doubt it because there's I think so far we've probably done 500 motors through this program. In fact, maybe I see maybe one request a month. Yeah. Periodically. 
Well, I get about 300 and turn it over to you. So maybe, maybe at any rate, you know, if you want to say that all MRC, black powder motors, A, whatever they were, um, maybe we'll get enough to do that. But right now we don't. We just get smatterings. We'll get one from this lot, one from that lot. For those that don't know, I am the contact point. Yes, Steve, see Steve. And it's up on the website. I'm going to save that a lot. We have a Facebook page with 3,640 members. We've added 1,100 since March, I think. Um, so we have a couple of moderators. Uh, Ryan and I do most of it. Um, we are we are pretty hard nosed, right? It's got to be about rockets, model rockets, or high power rockets, not liquid fuel rockets, um, unless they're scale topics, you know, professional for scale topics, not politics, uh, not pyrotechnics. Uh, we had one member get their account hijacked, and we saw some naughty pictures. That's not good either. Um, but we're trying to keep it, you know, light, so you you could send your kid to go read about rockets and not be. Um, Please do it early in the morning after we've gone through <laughs> the steep case. Sanity. Okay, so here's our concern. So we, we'll do, we have all the success, right? We're, we're doing great. But we still see rockets out there that probably should not be flown and certainly should not be flown the way they are flown, right? If you have a rocket and, you've, and, and you really want to fly it to scale N1, okay, cool rocket, and you've got some idea that it should be stable and maybe you've done the testing and so on, <laughs> and you've added fins, okay, but it's really hard to know whether that's going to be stable or not, even with all the work that you've done. Take it, wait, don't fly it in your backyard or on the playground, right? Take it somewhere, aim it away from everybody, do the hit, don't just do it as part of the National Sport Launch, just to take an example of Um We have too many near misses, we have a lot of landing mishaps, so I hear a lot about, I got my roof dented, what do I do? You pay them. That's what you do. You, when you launch a rocket, you put a rocket on the pad to be launched. You're taking responsibility for the outcome of that flight. Right? And our insurance will pay the really big stuff, but there's a hefty deductible that you pay, thousand dollars. There's another hefty deductible above that that Benar pays on your behalf the first time, which gets it to five thousand dollars. And most car dents are not that expensive, so it comes out of your pocket. So. Think about that when you're launching that thing with the, like I got one with five ounces in those weight. Go so that, that way. We don't want major <coughs> incidents. We don't even like minor incidents. They happen too often. We put a hole in a B-17, parked B-17. Really? Fire, it's a Ooh. fabric tail, right? Right. Rocket comes down with a sharp fin under parachute, lands on the tail of B-17, made a little triangular rip in. This was several years ago. Um, had to be taken off. The, the airplane was doing an air show. The whole tail thing had to be sent to some guy who does, you know, one guy in Ohio somewhere who does fabric covering, had to come back. It's an expensive thing to do, right? It doesn't have to happen. Let them drift away from the antique aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> we need to continue and to attract and retain new NAR members. Um, we have, we, we, we're doing really well on, in many areas, but we need to continue to do it. We need to work very hard in this um, developer troll problem that we seem to have. Um, all the good fields are eaten by these developer trolls. Um, or they'll buy the field and put it in reserve and kick you off anyway, even though they don't plan to develop it for a few years. I've heard about that even locally, right? We yeah, that. Right? Um, so we need to, we're probably going to get further and further away, but we can also do, make do with multiple kinds of fields, so you might have a club that has a model rocket launch on eight connected soccer fields one month and then goes to a high power launch that's further away the next month and just moves it around, so keep exposing people to all levels of the rocket because they're not making you know, drive in their car for six hours. We could still use more sections. I said we had like 4,000 section members, so that's 2,000 people without a section, so that's not good. So especially in some of the um, less populated areas of the country where there are lots of fields, it would be good to have more section members. Need more NAR volunteers? I'll start hammering on that once we get a list, because I just got this um, Board of Trustees um, action list, and we got a lot of, of uh, members to recruit, yeah, volunteers to recruit. And finally, we're gonna address this national event um, structure in general, and contest rocketry in particular, because that has not been doing as well. So let's talk about contest rocketry. Let's be honest, it's an integral part 
of our organizational history. It's what the NAR started out doing. It's a foundation for technical advancement in the field, right? If you want to, the reason model rockets get better and higher and faster and all those things is because of competition. It's the primary source of non-high power challenge in the area. If you don't want to get into high power for any, for whatever reason, you might, you might, maybe you don't want to pay for it, maybe you don't have a field for it, maybe you got kids and it's just too much of a, this is what you can do. We have a core group of very dedicated member enthusiasts, about almost 100 of them are in this room right now. But it's declining. You can look around. Every year I give this talk to a smaller and smaller group, and Trip before me, and Bunny before Trip. We have flat to declining participation in contest rocketry. I'm not sure that these numbers are completely accurate. It turns out to be difficult to tell because of the way the contest years work out and the overlap and when I get the data. Um, but it has not grown, even though NAR has grown by 30%. Um, it's becoming in, an insignificant part of the NAR, right? So it's a big deal for us at NARAM, but there's 5,700 NAR members that don't care, which I think is sad. I really think that when we do contest rock, we are doing a lot of what the core of this hobby is, and they're, they're, they're missing out. They're not involved. Just to let you know, I mean, there's more level three flyers in contest than all the contest rocketeers in the U.S. There's more teacher members of the NAR than there are contest flyers in the NAR. There are eight times as many junior high power flyers as there are junior contest flyers. So we're this this thing that we care about isn't doing well. We got some, some issues that we've identified. The board in particular, there's some barriers to entry. We have a very well established but insular. It's not a. It's not a insult. It means we're we're very tight with each other. But breaking into this is a very tough thing to do. I remember going to my first NARAM, and it was wow. It took me about six years to come back. Um, there's very few mentors that are available outside of the contest-oriented sections. So we all know there's a few sections out there that are very active, and you can, you can get hooked up in there. But there's 166 sections, right? We don't see anything like that showing up here. It takes a significant investment to be competitive. So, you know, if you're a dad and you got a kid who's in seventh grade or something, you want to try this thing out, and you look at what it takes, it's almost like getting into high power. You need a tower, you need a piston, you got to figure all that stuff out. You have to spend a lot of time, in particular, learning the techniques. So it's a significant investment. Highly technical, especially for the novice. So we throw pink book terms around all the time. Contrast factor, rating factor. These starting out, it's a very tough thing to break into. What is going on? And it's hard, and it's hard there's nobody you can ask if you're in one of those sections that doesn't have anybody who's flying. The designs are converging, so the, the, um, the best performance is kind of um, only incrementally getting better now. We, there's not a lot of breakthroughs happening. Um, and as a result, the, the, to get to that level, you have to be as good as the best people are right now. So, it's, so basically, if you take a very bright B divisioner in, it's going to take a couple of years to be competitive, and we lose their interest very quickly doing that. So maybe we want to do things that don't require that level of, um, at least a, a class of competition that doesn't require that level of technical challenge. Don't have a lot of contests. The number of regional and local contests is down dramatically. That wasn't on that chart, but that curve is that nose diving. So there's no exposure except for NARAM. So the hundred of you guys know about NARAM, but do the other 6,000 members of the NAR know about NARAM? I don't know. We also have an organizational structure. This happens in organizations. I, this is what I did for the um, big hunk of my career work with. Um, or I was mostly about safety, but it's a, it's a recognizable phenomenon. The organization is getting very tight, very coalesced, very professional, and it's very difficult for that kind of organization to drive change from within. It has to be has to be um, initiated from the outside. Sometimes that happens in a bad way. Uh, in an oil refiner, it happens when, when the plant blows up, right? People have, have been working in a certain way. They've always worked that way. They never want to change. They tell them it's a bad way. They don't believe you. And then you have a fire. And then they change. We're having a fire. It's a very slow fire, but it's a fire. Defined. So we need to fix that. The system has evolved such that everybody here is acting in good faith. All of us acting in good faith really have a hard time fixing it. 
we don't we we don't have a good way of addressing the problems. So that's contest rocketry. Let me come back with some solutions. National events. So we got Narcon that's strong and growing. It was bigger than NARUM the last three years, I think. Uh, NSL depends on the location, but there's a big demand for more locations. Maybe more NSLs, maybe uh, winter nationals and a summer nationals, or an east and a west. Um, we had a great time in, in South. There's all kinds of people in South Carolina, and there's there's people there that don't know what a contest rocket is, but they do love their age motors. Um, Narrow though is flat to declining in attendance. Seven days, some of us have noted this. I think Matt was one that, that published a manifesto not so long ago. Uh, seven days is probably too long for families these days, right? You miss two days of soccer practice and you're off the team or whatever. There's lots of good reasons. It's not, it's not mocking it, it's just the way the world is these days. Um, competition, the draw to NARM by com for competition is declining. We just talked about it at the last slide. The high power draw is increasing. That's part of this, the national sport launch thing, but that depends on the location. So if you have a NARAM with no waiver, you have you know 80 people show up or something like that. If you have a NARAM like at Preble last year, that was that was an unbelievable turnout, and it really wasn't a competition anymore. Competition NARAM was more of a high power uh, launch with some competition on the side over there in the corner with that tent over there. <laughs> um, it's a significant investment to put one of these things on. So Ed and Steven. Where did it go? See here? There he is, hiding in the back. Thank you. This is not fun. So it's, it's, it's really tough for me to be asking people to give up as much as they have to give up to put us in a site for eight days for for 70 or 100 people. That's that's we need to fix this. So we're gonna enhance this. The board of trustees established a special committee for the enhancement of national events uh, to recommend ways to attract more NAR members to the NARS national events and to reinvigorate all forms of competition rocketry. Um, John is going to chair it. He's hiding over there. <laughs> Keeps moving. Um, we're going to have the, spe the specifics of the chart. I mean, I want measurable goals. The, um, you know, the usual business kind of thing. Six Sigma guy says, yeah, you can't say do better. you got to say how much better. 20% better against what metric? Do you have the data? We're going to have a specific chart of membership, and we're going to require a two-thirds vote of the Board of Trustees uh, to launch that off. So that's what we're going to do. That's the, we, the Board of Trustees can't just do this in a vacuum. To enhance uh, contest rocketry, First of all, that committee I just mentioned has that. Second, so we got no bids for NARM for the first time. See, I was, John's been doing this for three years. I was did it for four years before that. Trip did it for years and years before that. Board, 